and welcome to Mass Moms Health Academy. Hi, I'm Ms. Kubitschek. I am the Health Related Technology Instructor. And I'm Mrs. Torres, the Health Information Management Medical Records Technology Instructor. We're so happy to have you join us to learn more about our careers in healthcare. We're hoping that you find an interest in joining one of our shops. So have you thought about it? What do you want to be? So just take a moment and join us as we show you what we do in this shop. Hi, and welcome to the Health Related Technology Shop. In this shop, we learn a variety of skills such as hand washing, infection control, how to put on PPE such as gloves, gowns, and masks. We also learn how to assist patients with ambulating and uh, transporting patients in and out of bed and with assistive devices. Um, as you can see, we have a real life hospital setting here. We also work with patients to learn vital sign skills. And these skills can be easily transferred into careers as a registered nurse, a nursing assistant, a medical assistant. You can walk, work in occupational and physical therapy. Uh, you can go on to become a doctor or a physician's assistant. Here at MassBound, we have relationships with St. Christopher's Hospital, where students can intern there on Fridays. We also have a really strong HOSA program where students can compete against students from all over Philadelphia and the state in different healthcare activities and competitions. If you're interested in healthcare, I would definitely urge you to consider um, this shop. There is a lot of great perks to working as a nurse or working in healthcare. The pay is great. The schedule can be great. There's a lot of flexibility as far as working in a hospital or working in a school. Um, working in a long-term care facility. And I think the most important thing is it's a very rewarding career because you get to help other people. All right, so please consider health-related technology and I look forward to seeing you next year. Hi, and welcome to Health Information Management. As you notice, we have our computers. We will enter medical data into the computers any electronic medical records or health records. We'll also learn privacy laws and you'll be certified in the HIPAA laws. Also, we have front desk responsibilities. You'll learn how to greet patients, take their information, um, put information again, billing information into the computers. Also, you'll have opportunities to become health information technologist. You can become an office manager. Also, a medical records technician. But you know what? After Mass Farm, you can reach for the stars. You can go anywhere you want to, as long as you continue your education. But keep on, let's go check out the room. As you look here, we will be certified as CPR and AED. We'll do children and we'll do adults. Also, we have community service that we get involved in, like the Breast Cancer Awareness Walk. We also do the Gift of Life, which is organ and tissue donation. We also have partnerships with the University of Pennsylvania, with Jefferson Hospital, with Temple Public Health. Our students are able to go there during the summer and they have an awesome time. Also, we have our equipment also. We'd like you to see what a hospital room looks like. Our students will be able to enter a room and get information from patients and respect their privacy. And also you learn simple skills or the basic skills like height and weight as well. And most importantly, the first skill in any program is washing your hands. So make sure that you wash your hands and think about this. Join us. Hopefully we'll see you next year at the Health Information Management. I'm Mr. Williams and I am the electrical instructor. And so I want to welcome you in and talk about some of the things that we do here in the electrical shop. Uh, and why it's important to learn a trade. Okay, so if you come in, you learn a trade about electrical, you can actually work on your own home, or if you have to pay someone, you, you will know exactly what they're there to do and how much it's gonna cost you. All right, so it's a lot of benefits to learning a trade. So, let's get started. 
First thing we want to do is talk about safety. Safety is extremely important uh, in the electrical shop, with all the shops here at Mass Bar, right? Safety is our number one priority, right? So safe, certain safety precautions we have to take. Of course, we always want to wear our safety glasses, okay? Whenever we're out in the shop area, working with tools, materials, cutting wire, we always want to wear our safety glasses. Uh, in some locations, we're also required to wear hard hats, all right? To keep us uh, from bumping our heads, to keep anything from falling down on us. We protect ourselves with hard hats. We have our safety gloves, okay? With cut wire, uh, using our hand tools. Safety gloves actually prevent you from pinching your fingers or even getting splinters in your fingers, all right? Also prevent calluses, because we do work with a whole bunch of hand tools, all right? So we have our safety glasses, we have our hard hat, we have our gloves, okay? Some of the safety precautions that we take care uh, at Mass Bomb. Another important item I like to discuss is you never want to work on a live circuit, okay? You always want to make, you always want to check and make sure that the circuit is de-energized, all right? You always want to make sure, all right? So we have our displays here, all right? And we always want to make sure that it's unplugged before we work on them. You never want to work on a live circuit, okay? Work on a live circuit, you run the risk of getting shocked, all right? And we want to prevent that. So I have a lot to talk about. We, we do a lot here at Mass Bomb in the electrical shop. It's a three-year course. Uh, students come in during their sophomore year. They work real hard up until their senior year. So there's three years here in the shop. We cover hand tools. Right, we learn the difference about hand tools. All right, so let's get to the fun stuff. All right, so I actually have a couple displays here that I set up. I don't know if you're ever curious how the switches in your house work and how you are able to go into a room, hit the light switch, and leave out at another location hit the switch and the light goes off. You come in at one location, you hit the switch, light comes on, you leave out at another location, hit the switch, the light goes off. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Or, if you live in a second or three-story dwelling, you can actually turn lights on as you go up the stairway, all right? Say, let's say you're on the first floor, you wanna to go to the second floor, but you wanna turn the light on at the second floor before you get there. So you hit the switch, right? The light goes on, you go to the second floor, you wanna go from the second to the third, so you wanna turn the light off on the second floor, turn the light on on the third floor. They are three and four way switches. All right, so we learn how switches work. Actually, we learn what they are first. Then we learn how to operate different type of switches. A single pole switch, all right? On and off position, written. And you can also tell that it's a single pole switch because it only has two terminals, okay? That's our single pole switch. This is our three-way switch, all right? And as you notice, there is no on, no off position. You could tell it's a three-way because it has three terminals. One, two, three. It's our three-way. This is our four-way switch, all right? A little bit thicker, 
All right, as you notice, there is no on, no off, and we can tell that it is a four-way because it has four terminals. One, two, three, four. Okay, so what's all this talk about switches? What's all this talk about switches? Three-way and four-way switches allow you to turn a light on or off from different locations. We have one, two, three, four, five switches. Five switches and four lamps, okay? And so each switch either turns the lamp on or turns it off. Let's see. All right, so switch one. All right, switch two is going to turn off our first lamp and turn on our second lamp. Ah, all right, so that's, we were on the first floor, all right, we went to the first floor, we turned that light on, we left the first floor, went to the second, turn that one off, turn this one off, second floor. All right, our third switch is going to turn light two off and light three on. It's our fourth switch down here in the corner. It's our fourth switch. Our fourth switch is going to turn off light three and turn on light four. All right? Three-way and four-way switches are good, uh, particularly if you have a long hallway and you're traveling down that hallway and you come in, you enter that hallway at one location you walk all the way down the hallway, right? Turning the lights on, then you're leaving out, right? You can actually use those switches to turn off the light. All right, so light four is on, light five. What do you think light five is gonna do? Turn it off, all right? Three-way, four-way switches allows us to turn lights on from different locations. So this is actually one of the wiring jobs that uh, students just finished working on, all right? And so we have two three-way switches and one four-way switches. And we'll, we'll get into this as we go along, but when you're working with switches, three-way switches, you always have to have a four-way in between. Now, one of the most important things about three-way switches and four-way switches. You have to know how to wire, all right? We, we actually, we, we, we start off kind of small, right? We work with our THHN wire. That's our thermic plastic high heat resistance nylon wire, right? We will talk about the American wire gauge as we go along and what the colors represent, okay? So we know black is our hot wire, white is our neutral wire, green is our ground wire, and if we need an additional hot wire, we can use a red wire, okay? Well, one important thing about three-way switches. Now, three-way switches have three terminals, but they also have a name. These terminals have a name, okay? And it's very important how you wire a three-way switch. If you wire a three-way switch incorrectly, it won't work, all right? And so we have our two travelers. This is a traveler terminal, terminal. And on this side of the switch, we have a traveler terminal. This is our common terminal, all right? Two travelers, one common. The students probably hear that in their sleep. Two travelers, one common, <laughs> all right? And on our four-way switches, we have an input and we have an output, all right? Because we need to go into that four-way switch and come out of it. For example, all right, this is our power source. Our black wire is our 
hot wire or a positive wire, all right? And so your black wire should always run to the common. And on this particular three-way switch, you, as you can see, it's a little darker than the other one. This is brass, this is like a bronze, all right? And that's how you can tell the difference between your traveler terminals and your common terminal. Hot to common, we have our two travelers. Remember I talked about the input and the output on the four-way switch, extremely important. Okay, so we're coming out of our three-way switch. We're running to our four-way switch, all right? Input, all right? We're going to the top of our four-way switch, okay, to the top of it. Two wires, two wires is coming from a three-way. Then we're going to come out of this four-way and go to our three-way, okay? We have our travelers, we have our common, all right? From the common, we're going to go to our light, okay? To our lamp, all right? Now, we talk about positive wires, negative wires. We talk about hot wires, neutral wires, black wire, white wire. The most important thing about an electrical circuit in order for it to operate or work correctly, it needs to be a complete path. We need to have a complete path, all right? A hot wire brings our power into the circuit, and it returns back to its source through our neutral wire. That's our complete circuit, all right? Switches actually open and closes our circuit, all right? In order for the light to operate, our circuit needs to be closed. When it's open, no electricity can flow through, all right? So a lot of fun stuff here, a lot of fun stuff. All right, I'm gonna plug this in and give it a check, okay? Let me, let me plug it in. We have our three-way switch, we have a four-way switch, we have another three-way switch, okay? Switches, three-way and four-way switches allow you to turn the light on from different locations, all right? That's one location. This will be our second location. Turn it off. We'll turn it back on from a different location. And it really doesn't matter what order. Wherever you're at, you can either turn it on or turn it off. Switches. They're pretty cool. Pretty fun to work with as well. All right? So that's just a little bit about the electrical shop. I hope to see you soon. Take care. Hey, Massbomb freshmen, my name is Mr. Capella. I'm the new plumbing technology teacher here at Massbomb. For all you freshman students who are looking for a lifelong skill that pays well, look no further than Massbomb plumbing. Besides getting this really cool shirt, having me as a teacher, you will learn all different types of plumbing disciplines. We'll talk about pipe connections, we'll talk about installing boilers, faucets, hot water heaters. I will teach you how to make in excess of $100,000 a year with what's just in this box. When you leave the Mass Bomb Plumbing program, you will have the basic knowledge to start a high paying career. Plumbers that own their own business can charge up to $125 to $185 an hour. Most master plumbers that work for a company make in excess of $100,000 a year. This is a high demand industry that is just begging for young adults like you to get involved in it. I will do my best to get you prepared for that career. So come build the Mass Bomb Plumbing Program with me, have fun while learning a lifelong high paying skill.
through a quick tour of the plumbing room. We're room 426. When you come in, you got a work set, a workstation on the left here. We got all our safety equipment, sink, our own water fountain, fresh water all year long in the plumbing room. That's a big plus. Right here we have where we're gonna cut and thread pipe. As you can see, you can see water lines right there. Over here, we're gonna be installing a kitchen and a bathroom. That's pretty neat. We walk over here, this is our supply closet. Got all of our supplies, our torch, all of our tools, all of our copper fittings, bunch of other plumbing equipment. Come out of the supply closet on the left here. This is where we're gonna be installing our water heaters and our boilers. We're gonna hook them up. Come across here to the other supply closet. We have our Nocti testing frame. And we got another supply closet with a bunch of other equipment. We got PVC fittings, toilets, power tools, a bunch of gas pipe. And over here we have another supply closet and even another supply closet. We got all of our pipe, copper pipe, steel pipe. We got PVC pipe, cast iron pipe. We'll be working with all that. And here we have a nice bathroom we'll be working on. This is our learning station here. This is where we'll be doing all of our theory work. Um, so I look forward to uh, having all of the freshmen sign up for the plumbing program. Again, it will be exciting. Uh, we get to work on some really neat stuff. Uh, big time hands-on shop. And, uh, some really cool theory. I look forward to seeing all of your faces in the plumbing and technology program. I am Mr. Sink. This is my shop area. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mr. Pfeiffer. I'm one of the other automotive teachers. Uh, me and Mr. Sink, we work together. We both do uh, automotive mechanics. So we'd like to take this opportunity to show you around the shop, show you some of the tools that we use uh, down here in the auto technology. Hey, another piece of equipment that we learned how to use in an automotive shop is the alignment machine. Okay, our students learn how to perform four-wheel alignment how to make the vehicle up the, up the road straight, uh, improve, it, improve handling and steering of the vehicle, and maximize the life of our tires. Okay, this is a state-of-the-art uh, piece of equipment that we can do um, all of today's modern cars. Okay guys, uh, two more pieces of equipment in auto shop that we use uh, on a daily basis. Is this, this is a what they call a road force wheel balancer. So we have to replace a tire or do some tire work put on any one of balance the tires so when the customer's driving up the road everything's nice and smooth there's no vibrations and so forth and this is our this is our tire machine this is the machine that actually takes the tires off the rim and puts the tires back on so this is another piece of equipment that our students learn and get to practice on before they start their career as an automotive technician okay so down there in the hallway, that's a 122 gym. You have the male, female bathrooms here. These are going to be your lockers. Mr. Pfeiffer's classroom is across there. This is mine, 121. You enter the classroom. This is where we spend approximately 30 minutes every day. We do the viewing here. As you can see, we have two smart boards. When we are done, we come into the computer lab where we do some simulations, practice. We get online. There are over 40 certifications you can get. You have a portfolio to take your parts. This is all the tasks you need to do. When you become a senior, you should have all this done. You get into the cabinet. You grab one of the sheets. You need to come to me and say, hey, I'm ready for this. Diagnose the entire way. Okay. This is when you get into the shop. So as you come in here, safety glass is on. As you can see, we've got vehicles working on. F-150 up on the lift. We 
You got a Toyota Prius hybrid, Toyota Corolla, another Toyota Prius hybrid. You get on your machines, you get on your vehicles, you grab your toolbox, and this is where we make it happen. Thank you for your time. I hope to see you guys in September in the auto shop. Thank you. Hey, ninth grade students, Chef Tim Lopez here in the Panther Cafe Kitchen at Mass Bomb High School. Today what I want to do is just demonstrate a couple of the skills that you can learn in culinary arts right in this kitchen. So what I'm going to prepare for you guys today, I'm going to show you how to take apart a chicken leg from its thigh, and I'm going to debone the thigh, then we're going to season it up, get some nice seasoned flour on it, we're going to do some pan frying. So let's start. So basically, if you've never done this before, you can take a look, you can see the thigh bone is right here. Right? Usually there's even like a line in the fat that kind of follows the bone. And then right here you can kind of see that natural separation. So you know when you go over here, you're going to cut straight through. And what you're going to do is you're going to find where the bones come together. This is known as a boning knife. And you're going to find the natural spot where these bones come together. And you're going to just slip in between them. And you're going to just take that take that leg right off, okay? We're gonna lay that here. All right, so here's our chicken thigh. A line of fat following the bone. This bone's kind of popped out a little bit for us. Okay, the tip of a boning knife is very, very sharp. The reason being is you use that to pull the meat away from the bone. This is used to debone beef, pork, chicken. Okay, we have a, a longer, more flexible knife for fish. As you can see, this one's kind of flexible. The fillet knife for fish is a lot more flexible than that. So this is a boning knife, all right? So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna make a cut right along that fat line and get down to that bone and then use that super sharp tip to scrape the meat away from the bone. Okay, what you're doing with this hand, we call this the guiding hand, this hand right here. You're manipulating the meat with that. Now you can stabilize your boning knife with a finger and you wanna just pull that meat away from that bone. The reason we're gonna debone the thigh is so we can slice straight through it later. It'll make for an excellent presentation, especially if someone who's never had a deboned thigh that's been pan fried, and you can slice right through it and not have to worry about the bone. I'm gonna come right up, and you just come down, you find the edges of that bone, you scrape it away, you wanna take care to make sure that you're seeing the cartilage that's in there. And remove that. Kind of just want to let the knife do the work. Like I said, the tip is really sharp, so if you're having issues with the blade itself, you go in just with the tip, and you can slice it away just like that. What we're going to do next is, I'm going to change my gloves real quick. All right, when we work with raw, protein, raw products like seafood, chicken, and fish, we always have to change our gloves in between what we're doing. Now, I'm still going to be working with the chicken, but we're also going to be adding flour and seasoning to it. So we change gloves a lot. You guys will be changing gloves a lot too. Not only does it keep you safe, it keeps the food safe. All right, so we've got our chicken. I'm going to take a little bit of fine sea salt. I'm going to season both sides of the chicken, flip it over, then I'm going to take my pepper, do some pepper on both sides, and fresh ground pepper is always going to be better than that stuff you buy pre-ground in the store. After a while, it just starts to taste like dust. It loses its potency. So fresh ground pepper is preferred. All right, so we've got our seasoned chicken. Now we're gonna take a little bit of seasoned flour that I made up earlier. Now this flour's got salt and pepper in it. It's also got a little bit of chopped parsley. And I'm gonna take a little bit of cornstarch. I'm gonna add that in. Kind of mix this around together. And then I kind of like my chicken a little bit more of a peppery kick, so I like to add a little bit more pepper to my seasoned flour.
Okay, and then I'm going to take the deboned chicken thigh. Now, the important part with this is you want to try to get it to keep its shape. All right. So you can lay it out. You want to get that flour all around it. And then once you've got the flour on the chicken, you want to get every part. See how you unfold that? It's still some parts without the flour. You can just dust it in here like this. Because every part that this flour cornstarch mixture touches and is on there is going to create a nice crisp crust on the outside. Alright, so we make sure we get it in every part. Shake it off a little bit, and then I kind of like to reshape it like so. Do the same thing with our chicken leg. We'll put that in there, tilt the bowl so you guys can see. Mise en place is a French term meaning preparing things before you're ready to cook. You can just add a little bit more flour to it just to keep the skin from drying out a little bit. And we come back to that. So once again, new task. I'm going to change my gloves and leave our chicken there. What I've got here is what's called a mise en place setup. Mise en place is a French term, as I said, and that means kind of getting stuff ready to go before you start to cook. All right. So we've got our chicken, we're going to pan fry that over there. Alright folks, so now we're moving on to our vegetable prep. Alright, we're going to have a pan seared chicken. I'm going to make a nice sauce for it. What I'd like to do today is this is broccolini. Alright, this is baby broccoli. Very, very tender. Okay, excellent quality when roasted or grilled. That's going to make an excellent accompaniment to the chicken. We've got some organic baby carrots with a little bit of stems on. Got to clean these ahead of time. You just got to peel them away and wash them really good. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to use one of these bowls here. All right. We're going to try to get the carrot be about half, cut it directly in half. What I like to do is I like to cut out what we call the bias. All right. So what that does is it creates that nice little triangle effect. I'd like to split these in half. They're going to roast up more evenly. And we'll split this in half as well. And we're keeping that little top on for presentation. Okay, You can eat it. It's edible. Most people don't eat it. They'll kind of like pick the carrot up with their fork and bite up to this part. And, and they'll just get rid of it. But it makes a really nice presentation with the fresh green tops on. So we're going to do the same thing for all of our carrots. We're going to find the, the, the halfway. I'm going to cut them in half, pop them in the bowl. So the carrots are going to go in the bowl and the broccolini is going to go in the bowl. And I will season those and I'm also going to add a little bit of honey. I love honey roasted carrots and I love that when we roast with honey it provides a little bit of caramelization and not too much sweet. Like honey is very sweet but not as sweet as if we use brown sugar or something else. Honey's really going to give us that caramelization. A lot of natural sweetness is going to come out of the broccolini and the carrots too as they cook. All right, so there you go. So you got your carrots prepped. I saved the tops of the carrots because these are excellent for garnish. You know, a lot of people will go out and spend a ton of money on fresh herbs. Here's some fresh herbs that I bought. Oregano and rosemary probably cost me about $2.99 just for that little bit at the store. All right, these are free, they were on the carrot top, so you can use these as garnish, and we'll get to that. All right, here's our broccolini. With broccolini, what you have to do is, you wanna take away about half of the stem. Okay, this part down right here is very, very fibrous. So you just come and you cut that away. If it's small like that, it can stay at that. If you've got something where it's multiple pieces that are really big, like for instance, this piece, you're gonna to wanna to go Cut that away, and you're going to want to break these up a little bit. So I like to go in with the knife, just split them, see if they're a little still too big. The goal with this is to get everything to be exactly the same thickness, kind of. All right, so you see how they're going to roast at exactly the same time. They're going to get done at the same time. It's very important consistency when you prepare something. 
And this is the chef's knife I've been working with. It's my new beauty, I love this thing. You notice my grip is different than the boning knife. The boning knife, I was kind of like this, or I was kind of like this. The chef knife, you have to kind of pinch it. You pinch grip it. So your thumb goes on the side, your other hand goes here, and then you've got complete control of the blade. Okay? We'll get into some more chopping later. So what I'm gonna do with these now, I'm gonna just toss them around a little bit. We're gonna add a little bit of pepper. We're gonna add some sea salt. And what I've done is I've mixed some oil just some regular vegetable oil, canola oil, with a little bit of honey. All right, and what I'll do is I'll put this on the veg. Like I said, I like to use the honey, so the oil will help it roast, and the honey will help it caramelize. All right, and you got gloves on, so you don't have to worry about touching this stuff. All right, part of the adventure of cooking is getting your hands into the ingredients and enjoying them. All right, so now I'm gonna toss my carrots and broccolini with the oil and honey. And it's got the salt and pepper on it. All right, when you're satisfied that it's fully coated, you wanna put them on your tray. Now you don't just wanna dump them on the tray, okay? You don't just wanna dump them on the tray and have them all mixed together like this. You can, but if you want to just double check how everything's cooking, you separate them. So you put them together to season them and coat them. And you can kind of separate them as you're putting them on the tray. So this is very helpful for when you're roasting two different kinds of vegetables on the same tray. Now if it was like a vegetable medley, if we had peppers and onions and eggplant, zucchini, squash, and we just wanted to dice those up and roast them, they would all be mixed together. With this, we're gonna kind of, when we go to plate it, we're gonna kind of keep them separate. We're not gonna have them all together, so I wanna roast them the same way. And so we got our broccolini separate. We got our carrots. You got a small piece like this that's gonna roast a lot quicker than the other ones. You can kind of tuck it in to the bigger piece. It'll protect it a little bit from the heat. All right, I'm gonna take off my gloves. put this into a oven. Now I pre-sprayed this pan so they're not going to stick. The oven's been preheated to 325 degrees. I'm going to slip that in there and we're going to have some roasted veg. We've got our veggies roasting. Now we're going to move on to our chicken. Okay, remember we took our chicken, we deboned the thigh, removed the leg, seasoned, seasoned it, seasoned flour. You're building layers of flavor. That's why we season the product, we season the flour, and now we're going to pan fry it. So what I've got over here I'm going to use a pair of tongs, okay? Safety, we go in hot oil with tongs. I've got my cast iron skillet, okay? I've got some canola oil in there. It's up to temperature. You can see the smoke coming off a little bit. I'm going to stick the chicken in. Now, if you can get closer, you can see that chicken is not going to go all the way in. This isn't deep frying. This is pan frying, okay? So what we're going to do is kind of let it get up to color. And you can see, see the color starting to change at the edge there? What you really want to do is develop a nice golden brown crust. All right? You can check it. You can lift it up. There we go. Okay? Do the same for this one. That's how we pan fry. It's kind of like deep frying, except the fat's only halfway up on the protein. Right over here, I've got a little herb and garlic sauce going. Put some fresh tarragon in it, some rosemary, some parsley, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of lemon. That'll taste really good with this chicken. And then you take a look at it, you lift it again, you take a look. All right? Kind of just move it around and get that nice crisp crust on it before we're going to stick it in the oven to finish. It's not going to cook all the way in this. That's the difference with pan frying. Pan frying, you're going to get it to where it needs to be, where it's got that crust, and then you finish it in the oven. I want to get this 
chicken nice and golden brown. We're developing a really good color on it. Most important thing to realize when you're working with hot oil, you got to make sure you know who's behind you on either side. All right? Safety is very important in the kitchen. If I'm frying something with hot oil, you're walking behind me, you say, behind you, chef. You say it loud so I can hear you because the kitchen is quiet because I'm the only one in here today. When this is full of students and we're banging out delicious food, it gets really loud. So you got to let people know if you're walking behind them. Okay? You don't want to bump me forward and suddenly I'm getting pan fried. That's a no-no. That's a big one. A poor grade, if you ask me, if you burn the chef. All right, so back to our chicken. Get that crust nice and golden brown. Let's flip it over one more time. Always with your, your side, especially with that deboned thigh, you want that skin side up to get nice and golden brown. You can develop color pan frying that you can't get in the oven. All right, you can roast chicken in the oven, yeah, you'll get some good color on it. When you pan fry chicken, you're gonna get all your color in this pan, not in the oven. So you wanna develop your best crust, your golden brown crust in the pan, then you take it out and you put it in the oven. So I'm gonna let this finish up and then we'll put it in the oven to have it cooked. All right, students, so we let our chicken finish up in the oven. We're gonna take a look at that right now. You always want to go in with a dry hand towel, not a moist or a damp one because you can burn yourself. And we're going to take its temperature to see if it's finished with a thermometer. All right, so we were looking for about 165 or better. We got 177 on our thigh. And then we're going to take a temperature of our leg. And we got 177, 178, almost 180 on the leg. So that chicken is done. Now it's time to clean. What I did for time's sake is I made up some wild rice pilaf for the chicken. What you can do, you want to get real fancy, you get one of these cups. We also have ring molds um, available. Sometimes I like to use the cup. Not only about portion control, it's kind of about plate design. Just want to tamp it down a little bit and before I do that I've got that beautiful lemon herb sauce right here for the chicken a lot of times in fancy restaurants they'll do this they'll lay a little bit of the sauce down to put the chicken in do is I'm going to take the rice, pop it right over top of that, okay? I'm going to take our vegetables, which are up here, and we're going to arrange them around the rice. We've got the roasted broccolini. You kind of want to let the curve of the broccolini do the work for you, let it wrap around the rice a little bit, all right? You don't want to be stingy with the vegetables, but you also don't want to give too many. All right, when it comes to the carrots, put them on this side. sauce. I'm going to add a little bit more sauce because our chicken's actually going to drape over it this way. And I talked before about that there was lemon in the sauce. So follow me over here for a second. We've got our lemon and we've got our herbs. Right? I said we're going to use some of those carrot tops for garnish. All right? So we pick out a couple of good ones of those and put those aside. Like I said, this is free, you know? Anytime you can save money in a professional kitchen, you wanna do that. And there's lemon in the sauce, so a nice slice of lemon will look really awesome as a twist on the plate. And we just brush that, that pit out of there. And we'll come over here. 
grab these. All right, so now we've got some chopped parsley, got some rosemary, we got some carrot tops and our lemon. We start with our chicken leg. And rest it right against the rice like that. And the rice will kind of just grab a hold of it. This is the cool part right here. I'm gonna grab my chef's knife, folks. We got our thigh. There's no bone in this thigh. It's juicy, it's delicious, it's crisp. So we can slice right through that crisp skin. All right, we got nice, juicy, boneless chicken thigh. Just pinch the broccolini a little bit. Spread that right there. Maybe I, I can change it up at the last minute, say maybe I don't want the whole lemon. Take a little bit of the carrot. And you just go with one. Sorry, folks. Just tuck them right there. And we get a little parsley. Finish it off. All right. Now, if you want to finish up, you can also decorate with sauce put some sauce in a squeeze bottle. You know, a lot of times you'll see a lot of fancy restaurants do this. I wanted to just do a little on the top of my chicken like this. Just give it another head of parsley. Like that. All right, here you have it. Order up. Okay, we got pan fried chicken with an herb and garlic sauce with lemon, some wild rice, and some honey roasted baby organic carrots and broccolini. All right, so you want to get a nice zoom in on that. Now you might say, Chef, are you only going to teach us how to do high end stuff? No teach you guys how to do some really banging barbecue too. Chef Jazz and I are ready to not only get you on a culinary adventure, but also get you to try and make things you've never had before, but also get into some really classic favorites. All right, so here you go. Culinary Arts Two Ways from the Panther Cafe Kitchen. Thanks, students. Hi, I'm Mr. Blyweiss. I teach graphic design, the CTE graphic design program here at Max Baum High School. And um, I wanted to talk with students who are interested in coming to this program, maybe don't know what it's about, maybe are curious to see uh, if it might be right for them, uh, and show you a little bit about what, uh, what graphic design is all about. So when we talk about graphic design, let's take a look at the last word in that, design. Design is when you are trying to create something that didn't exist, make something that solves a problem, uh, or improve something. And there's all sorts of disciplines and, and different things that you can do and make and work in when it comes to design. When we talk about graphic design, we're talking about solving problems or making improvements in terms of visual communication. How do we get messages across to people uh, and have them understand and take in their meaning using text, pictures, color, and where they're located. When it comes to graphic design, when it comes to making decisions about how to get messages across to people so that they understand it, have a reaction to it, maybe take an action based on that, um, you have already been doing a lot of that and probably don't even realize it. Take a look at the screen, and if you've ever gone off and made a meme, put together an image and some text to try to be funny or to try to get a message across to somebody, very basic terms, that's a graphic design. If you've ever used a social media platform and put a filter on a picture of you or somebody else, you are using elements and principles of art 
in a technology context to try to get people to um, think about things or respond to things a certain way. Okay? If you have ever used word processing, if you've ever used Google Docs or Microsoft Word to write a report or try to uh, put information down on a page that needs to be printed or needs to be turned into a teacher, there are so many decisions that you're already making that are graphic design decisions in order to help somebody, your teacher or whomever else has to read this, you're already making those graphic design decisions to help somebody look at this, understand the message you're trying to get across and respond to it. We talk about sizes of, we talk about sizes of text, we talk about colors and positions of text, the amount of white space around uh, the edge of a page. Little decisions like that, you may not think about them much at the time, but these are graphic design decisions that help get a message across in a particular way. A lot of what we do deals with um, pictures, a lot of what we do deals with the creation of art and the manipulation of content. I'm not looking for anybody to come into this class or leave this class as a fine artist. You don't necessarily have to come in here or leave here as Monet or Picasso or anything like that. Design is problem solving. I'm looking for problem solvers. I'm looking for thinkers. I'm looking for people who can come up with ways to address communication solutions, get messages out to people, uh, sometimes make the challenge of a very narrow message or very specific things to use and come up with solutions that look really, really good. Um, some of the stuff that we do here, uh, a lot of the stuff that we do here, you're gonna learn about elements and principles of art and then you're going to apply them in technological contexts. Industry standard hardware, is Apple IMAX, industry standard software, one of the pieces of software you're looking at right now is Adobe Illustrator. Adobe Illustrator creates art using lines, points, curves, mathematics. These images are scalable. These images are able to be placed uh, without distortion on anything from the side of a pencil to the side of a bus to the side of a building. So uh, we, when it comes to making this kind of art with points and with lines and with math, it's stuff that you can manipulate sometimes very easily and have a lot of control over. Um, the only thing is, this kind of stuff is not photographic. We'll get into photographic stuff in a little bit. Some of the other work that we're going to be doing is in an application called InDesign, also from Adobe. This is where we bring text, images, color, and start to arrange them into documents. Those documents can be anything from posters, to postcards, to brochures, to much larger documents like newsletters, newspapers, books and magazines, even catalogs for products, okay? Then you'll start playing around with Photoshop. Photoshop is the one uh, piece of software from Adobe that a lot of people already know about. This is the kind of stuff that allows you to create images from scratch or manipulate images that have already come in from other sources, whether you scan them or whether you photograph them with a real camera like this or even the cameras that are on your phone. And Photoshop is powerful enough that you can not only create your own images from scratch, but manipulate and combine images so that you get all sorts of, let's see, you get all sorts of different effects and build up final images and uh, final results from a whole bunch of different special effects your own creations, and multiple different um, sources, okay? What we do with this information is we make sure that we teach you all about how to use these pieces of software and hardware. We teach you about 
um, the concepts behind them, the principles and elements to make sure that you understand how to bring stuff together to make a strong composition and get a message out to other people uh, that they're going to be able to respond to. That re response may be psychological or emotional. It may be doing a certain thing. Buy my product. Uh, vote for my candidate. And this is a field of work. Uh, this is a trade that um, is very important because not only is it here, not only is a program like this here to help you understand how the world meets, communicates with you, it's also here to help you better understand how you can better communicate with the world. These concepts also can be used for um, other disciplines of design and other uh, fields of employment. You can take the stuff that you learn about color and form and composition of images and objects and go into things like photography, go into things like fashion design, film and video editing, um, animation, game design, architecture, a whole lot of creative fields that the stuff that you start to learn about here in graphic design um, can help you with. So um, hopefully you'll be interested, hopefully this is going to be uh, something that is cool, some cool toys to play with, some cool results to get, some very interesting things to learn, um, and hopefully a path to uh, some really interesting uh, and really innovative and important ways of working and communicating out in the real world. Again, this is the CTE program in graphic design. Uh, I'm Mr. Blyweiss, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Hello, I'm Mr. Blocker. I teach the welding at Mass Bomb here. So just want to tell you a little bit about my shop, what we do, the safety, everything that's going on for us welding. Um, if you look around in the real world, everything you look at, cars, trains, boats, buses, the chairs that we uh, sit in in the uh, classroom, the welding booths, welding is everywhere. So like I said, I just want to tell everybody a little bit about the welding shop. Hopefully you guys uh, get a chance to come in here, explore a little bit more as far as the machines and what we got going on. Um, over in these welding booths, I want to tell you a little bit about the safety we got going on. First thing we got, start from top to bottom, you got your welding hat. Different students like their, their welding hats. This particular hat is pretty popular amongst my students. I guess they like the flames. Uh, some students like the uh, beanie type welding caps. You know, it's just personal preference. Um, for my uh, female students, the females usually wear the bandanas over their head and um, they usually kind of stray away from the welding caps because they usually have a lot more hair on their head. Moving on down, you got your safety glasses. Anytime you're in the welding shop, you got to have your safety glasses on at all times. And you, once you leave that classroom, you come out in this shop, you got to have your safety glasses on. Um, you got students using grinders, drills, welding, cutting torches. You got a lot of things going on, so you gotta have your safety glasses on at all times. So, that's one thing I recommend in the shop at all times. Next thing we have is your welding jackets. Most of the students, they wear the green welding jackets. Um, these jackets protect your clothes from getting burns, burns, sparks. Um, just basically protect your clothes from getting dirty also. So these jackets are pretty durable. They are uh, flame or fire resistant, so they won't catch on fire even though the sparks kind of burn them. You know, they just burn them and then they uh, 
could pretty much go out. So that's why we wear the welding jackets. Like I said, they take a lot of spark burns, you know, and actually protect our skin from the radiation from the uh, welding arc. Also with the welding jackets, once students start getting a little bit more advanced and they start doing like different welding positions, they might move on to the heavier welding jackets just to protect them a little bit more, especially their arms and their shoulders. So they wear these leather welding jackets. Welding gloves. You got your basic stick welding gloves. They come in different colors. Um, these right here are for stick welding. The thinner welding gloves that you probably see me wearing pretty much all the time are more for uh, TIG welding um, and MIG welding. I know you guys are hearing me saying stick welding, MIG welding, but once you get in the welding shop, you'll see all the different kind of welding processes that you get to do. Um, when we first started the video, I was actually in this welding booth, stick welding. That's what most of the students learn on, learn first thing when they come into the shop, how to stick weld. So that's like first and foremost. Now we get to the fun stuff. You know, since we're dealing with uh, COVID now, things change. The students used to get these uh, welding shields and, you know, once they're done, they put them back on the shelf with the rest of them. But hopefully you guys and girls, hopefully we're getting something nicer. These are all the darkening welding shields. So once you get your welding shield in this welding shop, you keep it. You know, you don't give it back, it's yours forever. That's one of the nice things about you know what's going on now I guess so you get a nice welding shield but a couple of different things with these welding shields this particular welding shield is pretty prehistoric um, when you put it on you cannot see what you're doing until you start welding that's the bad thing about this welding shield but they've been around for years when I was a student this is what I used this this welding shield right here, I think this was one of the seniors that uh, recently graduated or one of the juniors, I'm not sure. But I think they got this off of Amazon for probably like 20, 30 bucks, you know. This is a pretty nice welding shield, but the nice thing about this, if you're walking around the shop, grinding, cutting, you know, you can have this welding shield on. But once you start welding, it automatically goes dark. So as soon as you see that bright light from the welding arc, it goes dark and you can uh, use that for welding. So these are nicer shields. So keeping my finger crossed, hopefully I'll be giving all my students a similar welding shield just like this guy here. Uh, might not have the fancy designs, but I'm pretty sure the uh, Mass Bomb students can uh, paint something or draw something on there or put some nice stickers on there, decorated. Moving on. Anytime you're welding, you gotta use your chip and hammer, wire brush. These are pretty much in every welding booth. Once you're done welding, so say if you're welding a piece of metal, you would knock off the slag. If it's a good weld, you don't have to hit it too hard. You just pretty much rub it and just hit it with the wire brush. That's pretty much all you got to do. Anything in this shop, I always tell my students have their welding gloves on at all times because any metal that you might pick up might be hot. So always have your welding gloves on. Right here you got your welding rod. Like I said, this is for stick welding, shielded metal arc welding. Um, as you welding, this, this welding rod gets consumed into the puddle 
to create your well. So that's basically one of the things with stick well. But once you become a student in this class, I'll tell you everything about welding with these welding rods. Um, jumping back over here. Anytime you're welding, you know, I don't want my students picking up any hot metal. I always have them use some clamps. And then we dip it into the uh, water to cool it off. Next thing, students are wearing their khaki pants. You can also wear some jeans over top of your khaki pants. Also, boots. You want to have leather boots. Um, steel toe is what I prefer. So if you got to get boots, that's the only thing with welding and probably all the shops in uh, Mass Farm, you probably got to buy your own boots. Um, if you have a pair of old Timberland boots, a pair of hiking boots, as long as they leather boots, you're in good shape to wear for welding. And uh, if you have any issues about boots, just bring them in and I'll tell you if they're good boots or not for welding. That's what we got going on for as well. Um, one thing all my students that they do learn in this shop is how to use a tape measure. This tape measure, that welding shield, all this stuff in here makes you a lot of money. Um, the reason why you take welding, learn a skill, learn a craft, learn a trade, and make money for you and your family. So that's some of the things with welding. But just one thing with tape measures, pretty much every day we're doing some kind of math. If, if it's reading a tape measure, if it's multiplying, adding, subtracting, fractions, that's what we do. So every day we spend at least a half an hour with just learning theory of welding, doing some math, and different things like that. Here's another auto darkening welding shield. Like I said, they have different price points. Some can be two, three hundred dollars. Some can be thirty, forty dollars. Um, starting off, I always buy my students just to get a one that costs around thirty, forty, fifty bucks. You know, nothing super expensive. But like I said before, fingers crossed, we should be getting some of these. Anytime we weld them, all around the shop, we got fire extinguishers, big, bigger ones, smaller ones. Um, but one thing you learn is safety. Um, safety is a big thing. If you don't work safe in the shop, shut everything down. We go in the classroom and uh, you know talk about, figure out what we need to do to stay safe. We don't need no issues, no problems with you know somebody getting hurt. So that's why we preach safety all the time in the welding shop and any of the shops in uh, Mass Farm High School. So we always talking about safety and that's one thing you gotta know before you even come out in the shop is safety. So, you know, we, we, take, we take a lot of pride in, you know, teaching the students safety. Um, most of the welding booths got some kind of poster in there. I got posters all around the, uh, the classroom. Ventilation. Anytime you're welding, we turn on the ventilation before you start welding and the fumes get sucked up into the air ducts and outside, you know, so you won't be breathing any of the fumes. Taking a walk over here. It's just different things that the students have welded. The M, uh, I guess this, um, this uh, Falcon right here. That was going to be a hall pass for the welding shop, but, you know, I venture not to do that because uh, <laughs> weight and safety. The students learn how to work on different kind of metal. This is stainless steel, this is aluminum. This is basic TIG welding. 
Um, pretty much my juniors and seniors are working on a lot of TIG welding, gas tungsten arc welding. And this is some of the stuff that they're doing just starting off. You know, so they get to learn all this good stuff. They like making things. Um, students like making their initials, you know, whatever the case may be. They work on different uh, assignments. This is a T joint, you know, so they got to cut the metal, tack it together, and then they put their welds on there, and then they check the size of their weld with the uh, welding gauges. So that's one of the things the students had to do. Power tools, students learn how to work on all different kind of power tools, and also hand tools. Um, pretty much every day they, you know, you'll see a student using a grinder in a welding shop, pretty much every day. Students learn how to use drills, grinders, um, band saws. So they learn a, a whole lot with different power tools and hand tools. They learn about uh, electricity, and like I said, electrical safety. They learn about uh, just being their, their environment, being safe before they even weld. So they just learn everything about safety. Safety is all year round. We learn it every day. No matter if they're in the 10th grade, 11th grade, or senior year, they learn safety pretty much every day. So just to end that, if any student pick, pick welding, you know, if you're in the school, stop by the welding shop. You know, I give you a tour around the welding shop, let you see what's going on, and hopefully you pick welding. Thanks again, and I'm Mr. Blocker. Go. Hi, you guys. I am Chef Jazz Pinkney. I am one of the culinary instructors here at Mass Bomb High School. Um, in addition to the savory side of everything, which Chef Tim has shown you guys in his video, I also want to give you a taste of the sweet side.
Okay, guys, hopefully you enjoyed your sweet tutorial. Hopefully we see you soon at Jules E.M. Espon. Bye-bye, guys. Okay, hello, everybody. My name is Mr. Wazalewski. I teach the carpentry technology class at Mascot. And uh, today we're just going to take a few videos of some of the tools that you might be using if you become a member of the uh, carpenter team. Uh, this here is a miter saw. It's one of the saws you're going to be using majority of the time. Every day you'll be using this particular saw after the safety uh, training of you. And uh, I'll give a quick demonstration of what the saw can do. Okay, uh, you can see some of the lumber over here. So we're going to go over there, we're going to grab a piece of the lumber. And each day you come in, Wazalewski will tell you maybe once a certain size. Well, we stand here, we hold it, we stand straight, a little bit off center, come down slowly. You see the line that it makes, and we turn it on. We shut it off, we don't lift it until the blade stops. It's basically that simple. This has multiple operations or uses this saw, which over the time, three years time, you would begin to use. It turns on an angle to do an angle cut here, to do an angle cut here. It can cut larger pieces of wood by pulling out and down and back in. So it's a very nice tool to use for carpentry. Uh, I would get close that. Well, it's very popular. It's called the panel saw. Plus large pieces of plywood. You'll also use this on a regular basis. With this operation, you put the wood in, and you bring the blade to the wood. Something like that saw. You bring the blade down, this one you pull down. Okay? Have it come over here. education curriculum that is nationally recognized and will explore the dynamics of the business and give an environment. We'll look at the marketing landscape, we'll look at principles of economics, we'll look at finance, money matters, we'll look at uh, we'll look at just the dynamic career opportunities in the sport and entertainment industry. If you're looking for a fast paced and a high visibility profession, kids, this is the profession to be in. I sat last night and I talked, I just put down a bunch of my ideas about a vision for the program since it's a brand new program. And if you allow me to use notes, because I didn't want to forget a lot of the things that were on my mind that I would like to share with you. Um, so I, I'm going to use, I, mean, I, I will have notes here. Again, it's a brand new program. It's uh, it's offered for the first year in the 2021 season here, the school year, and it'll be going moving forward. There'll be a bit sports marketing management too, 
and then a sports marketing and management three. So it'll be a three year uh, CTE program. They'll, it's, you'll be exposed kids to just a comprehensive introduction to business. You'll get to understand the fundamentals of basic marketing principles, which of course can be applied against the uh, entire business landscape. You'll learn economics. You'll learn about supply and demand, producers and consumers, and product placement, and why retailers do what they do out there, why consumers do what they do out there, how we target customers and consumers out there, whether it's a LeBron James that we're marketing or if it's a can of Coke. There'll be lots of hands-on activities, kids. There'll be lots of project-based learning opportunities. We'll be doing group work. We'll just, we'll take a look at current events and we'll create our own, we'll create our own products in the course. You'll have, op you'll have access to new digital learning tools, which are out there for us. It's exciting to, to know also that we'll have, as a new course, we'll have a new lab. We have new computers that are ready to be deployed and be, be installed. We're going to have state-of-the-art equipment. We'll have t-shirt making machines, uh, poster machines, faxes, copiers. We'll have a camera kit that we can create our own digital and, and, and video presentations. With that and said, that there's going to be extensive use of mixed media in the class. We'll be looking at print, audio, digital media. We'll create it we'll present it, and we'll promote it. You'll be members, this is exciting also, kids, you'll be members of a, a nationally recognized student organization called DECA. And MassBomb will have their own chapter. You'll have the opportunity to go compete against schools in, that have the CTE program in Philadelphia, in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it could be national. We'll have the opportunity to fundraise with uh, with maybe some of the things that that we'll have, some of the resources and the the, the digital, the, the high tech equipment that we have. You'll be able to fundraise, and we'll create our own funds for our chapter of Deca, so that we can go travel and we can go compete. So it's pretty exciting. What's really exciting is also is our vision of building relationships with the local sports or, and of entertainment organizations in Philadelphia, in this whole region. We're talking about the Sixers, the Eagles, the Flyers, the Phillies. We're looking at the Soul. We're looking at the Union. We're looking at the Philadelphia Zoo, the Convention Center. We're looking at any partner out there that, that works with marketing and management to come partner with us, to come help us build this program together. And it's pr pretty exciting so that we'll get to understand the inner workings of the organizations, other than just understanding as a fan on the outside what goes on. Let's dig into what goes on on the inside of an organization. Some of the other things that you'll learn, kids, is that we'll learn from a sports marketing and management perspective. You'll learn about branding, merchandising, licensing, sponsorships. Uh, We'll look at sports agents and their roles and responsibilities and what kind of career opportunities are available there. We'll do project planning. We'll look at management consultants and see if that's what, something that we'd like to do. Prior to, oh, prior to graduation, you'll have the opportunity to become nationally certified by taking a nationally certified exam. And it's the National Retail Federation certification and customer service say that three times fast but that will give you a certification that will be recognized around the country you'll have the opportunity to work with other shops in the school to help them build their products and their services and help them market their products and services to other students in the school and to incoming freshmen so it's pretty exciting it's I, I believe that the sports marketing and management program has a, a little bit to offer everyone. If you have, if you have an excitement, and if you have a uh, a desire to learn a little bit about business, 
this is the this is the curriculum for you kids. Um, the last thing I can say to you is that we're building a team and we're expecting and we're we're expecting great things from the organization and we hope that you become part of it with us. That said, thank you very much.